David de Wisner για να συνεχίσει με μερικέ σπουδέ κουβέντε. Welcome you all here uh, in turn. I think it's uh, quite appropriate for me to thank Hoi Yi, Bob King, Ioana Kutsunano, Costas Vasalas, and the entire team of people who work day in and day out at the U.S. Consulate General of Thessaloniki to put on this event. And I think it's pretty well known throughout Greece that uh, this is the place to be the morning after the election. You guys put on a great party. And so if you don't mind uh, giving up a round of applause for Hoyt and the team here. Um, I'd like to thank also a group of people who are rarely acknowledged in this type of public event, uh, with whom I've worked in the past, actually as a wayward colleague, uh, and that would be the press corps of the city of Thessaloniki, and in general the media, the journalists in uh, Greece. Uh, I think what's interesting about this election, among many, many other things, is the unprecedented level of interest outside the United States in the campaign itself, in the candidates, in the platforms of the political parties, and now, of course, in the outcome of the election. And uh, I'm confident when I turn on Greek TV that I actually can get a very uh, reliable and useful information, and so you guys owe it to yourself. You're not always acknowledged, but uh, do a great job. I'm here <clears throat> representing the American College of Thessaloniki, and one of my uh, tasks at ACT is uh, to direct the Michael Dukakis Chair in Public Policy and Service, uh, which now is entering its 10th season of public affairs activities. Uh, it's a non-partisan forum for debate on public issues. And one of the things we do every two years when there's a general election, especially in the presidential election years, every four years, is to ensure that the American students who study at ACT register to vote and cast their ballot. Uh, this semester we have over 100 American students uh, studying at uh, universities throughout the United States, and thanks to the work of my colleagues in the International Studies Program, uh, well over 70% of those young people registered and voted. And this is a number that we're seeing throughout the United States. I'm pretty proud of that. One of my students, actually, a uh, resident of the state of Iowa, got involved last year volunteered to canvass for Barack Obama just prior to the primaries, caucused for Barack Obama during the Iowa primary, and stayed active even when she came back to Greece to resume her studies uh, with the organization known as Democrats Abroad. You know, both the American political parties, Republicans and Democrats, have uh, units that operate in countries where you have American expatriates. This is great. We have young people getting involved in unprecedented numbers in this particular election. And I, thought, I hope it's something that rubs off on young people here in Greece and in the other countries uh, whose uh, students come and spend some time here in Greece with us, or uh, as the case might be, at the public university, uh, represented uh, in the person of Theo Karbunarikis. I called the election about 10 days ago. It seemed to me that the polls were indicating a fairly clear Obama victory. But the actual impact of that fact really started to sink in last night as I was looking at the internet one last night. And I had four thoughts which I jotted down very quickly. I'm humbled that we have elected an American who's of African origin. I'm moved. I'm saddened that such a great public servant as John McCain was defeated. He's a great man. If you watch his concession speech, there has rarely been a more graceful concession, a defeat in American public life. 
I'm proud to be American right now, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm proud that so many people voted, perhaps for the first time. I'm proud that a group of Americans who've been in the margins of American public life have come to the fore, as was the case in 2004, when the so-called evangelical vote emerged and helped George Bush be reelected. This is very good for American public life, that the entire population is able to express itself in the elections during the campaigns, and I'm very proud to be a part of that. I'm hopeful, too, that the bitterness and divisiveness of any campaign, but of this campaign in particular, um, can be, come very quickly a thing of the past. If a majority of American citizens, taking the lead of Senator McCain, except the fact that they have a president, person who perhaps they did not vote for, but who is their leader? It's constitutional, it's legal, we understand that, and hopefully we accept it. If you're a Republican, you'll work with your party for the next round of elections. If you're a Democrat, you'll be happy, you'll celebrate, but you won't gloat, because the reality of American public life is we win sometimes, you win sometimes. And that's something we learned to live with. That's why democracy can flourish. Uh, three insights I have had over the course of the last six to eight months, and I'd say, well, they've been pretty accurate. I read an op-ed piece by the somewhat controversial uh, conservative commentator of the New York Times, David Brooks, commenting on the primaries back in February, and he says, well, nobody really knows what's going on here. And I think that's one of the themes that we've been seeing here. You've got all the guys on TV and writing in the papers and writing the blogs and talking at podiums like myself, and very few people would have been able to predict a year ago, let alone perhaps a couple months ago, that Barack Obama would be elected, that he would be nominated. You may recall four years ago I predicted we would have a race between Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani. Well, I'm a New Yorker, so that makes a little bit of sense. But this is it. This has been the election to turn punditry on its head. And I think part of the reason for that is the availability over the Internet of so much information, a sense that you yourself could have an expertise in American politics just by spending a few hours a day uh, looking at sites on the internet. My second thought came as I was addressing an email from one of my former American students, a young man, I think of Middle Eastern origin, who studied at a very prominent American university and has a job working at a brokerage firm. I presume he still has his job now, I don't know. And he asked me, well, it seems to me that, you know, these are the things that are going on, and this is a candidate that uh, expresses uh, the best solutions for that particular issue. And I said, guys, this is about race. Are we ready to elect an individual of African descent president of the United States? And you know, when a French uh, media team goes into a truck stop in Iowa, which is typically full of people who Democrats voted Democrat all their life, and he asks, whom are you voting for? And they say, we're voting for McCain. The journalist asks why, and the individual looks in the camera and says, I don't like niggers. Race is a fact in American life. It's not only African Americans, it's a fact. It's something we live with, something we try to deal with. You've seen a lot in the news about the negative campaign tactics of the Republicans, and this may be media bias, it may be true, but the fact is there on both sides. You have people who have difficulty accepting the fact that a person of color can become President of the United States. Well, I hope we've overcome that. My third thought, very briefly, when it was announced that Sarah Palin would be the vice presidential pick of John McCain, I thought that's it for the GOP. The so-called party of the big tent is ripping at the seams. They say, which direction does the Republican Party want to go in? I mean, we know the Democrats have a similar problem, the rainbow coalition it's called sometimes. The fact of American political life, that the parties are decentralized, there's an enormous degree of diversity in the composition of the parties, 
But at this particular juncture, it wasn't clear, in my mind, in the minds of lots of people watching, which direction the Republican Party went, wanted to go in. And this has been followed up. I had this insight, what, a couple months ago. You'll see now more and more moderate Republicans are questioning the, the wisdom of that particular poll. I don't want to say it was good or bad. I don't want to reveal what my particular uh, choice of presidential candidate would have been. But it does appear to me that that was one of the problems that the Republicans had. Are they going to be the party of George Bush? Are they going to be the party of John McCain? Or are they going to try to be a little bit of both? Because they are not the same persona. Now what are we going to look for in the next four years? You have a Democrat majority, or Democratic majority. Do I sound like George Bush there a little bit? That was a slip. <laughs> In the Congress, they're doing some of the uh, polling right up on the TV screen behind us. Some of the Democrats in Congress will want to go faster than Barack Obama will want to go. He does have to represent all Americans. How is he going to handle hostility in the opposition and hostility from the more radical elements of his own party? This is a big question. He himself has already hinted that he's not going to be changing a lot of things in a hundred days, it may take a thousand days, it may take four years. And I think that's a responsible thing to say. But he's got a lot of challenges. I would say looking at the way he managed his campaign, if there's a person in American politics who's up to that challenge, it may well be Barack Obama. And I think we should all hope that he's successful. Folks, this time four years ago, I was looking at the next round of elections. The political parties are doing that. They're starting at what's happening in the United States. Next round of elections, the uh, local governance, state uh, legislatures, governorships. Uh, 2010, 2010. 2010 is an important year because we conduct a census. And if a particular party controls a legislature in a state that has incoming population, they can change the shape of the districts such that that party stands a better chance to elect members of Congress in Washington. This is something, this is a fact of American life. It's always changing. Republicans did it very well in 2000. We'll see what happens. The indications are that while the focus in the federal government in Washington has been on a democratic sweep, what we call a triple, it's not certain whether the Republicans will do so badly in state and local elections, and that means the next time around, the Republicans can very well be competitive. Bear in mind, this is part of the great dynamic of American politics. Two things further that we need to watch out for, they'll probably be a little bit less under the radar screen, particularly the first. Barack Obama's the first campaign, uh, first candidate in American history to forego public financing for his campaign. He raised an enormous amount of money uniquely from private sources. I would think one of the first things John McCain is going to do when he goes back to the Senate is to introduce legislation that will regulate this. He has that reputation. The one guy had a clear deficit, John McCain, because he accepted public financing, which means 84 million and that's all you get. We're expecting the total for the presidential race alone to exceed one billion dollars for advertising, campaigning, and everything else that goes. That's a lot of money. Maybe we need to look at that. Observers on both sides of the political spectrum in the United States are also predicting that this election will mark the death of mainstream media. You see it already, uh, stations like MSNBC and Fox News are clearly partisan in the way they uh, look at the election, particularly the commentary. And uh, you know, we used to pride ourselves in the United States that journalism was done a little bit differently. You could have a mainstream national media that was nonpartisan. And it appears now that we're looking a little bit like France or Britain or Greece or European countries where the newspapers pretty much take sides. And I think this is something we need to look at. Now, there is an alternative form of journalism for which I have some hope, and that's what you see on the blogs, the weblogs on the internet. 
And you often are going to see, in fact, a Pew Institute study just done last week indicates that more and more people are turning to the internet for information about the campaigns. And I think this is a trend that will persist. But we need to worry about the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Washington Times and some of these newspapers that seem to be uh, taking sides a little bit more explicitly in their coverage of uh, events. That's something which, uh, as an American, I fear. I'd like to thank you for hearing me out this afternoon. And I